on January 12th, um, Malaysia's uh, young Tuan Agong, who's the king of Malaysia, declared a state of emergency in response to the an upsurge in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, but there is uh, some skepticism about the motivations uh, of this declaration of state of emergency. So today I'm speaking to Arul, who is the Deputy Chairperson of Party Socialist Malaysia, PSM. Uh, uh, welcome, Arul. And um, so is this okay. really uh, a genuine response to the, the pandemic? I mean, uh, everybody was uh, waiting for a new uh, movement control uh, a uh, semi-lockdown to be done, you know, that was something expected, but no one expected an emergency, you know. And uh, so uh, everyone said, because one day before the emergency was uh, proclaimed by the king, the prime minister had a national audience and he told everyone that we are going into a movement control act, eh? which is actually the powers of the MCO is quite uh, wide. If they can use military, they can, you know, they can um, uh, find people, uh, they can, you know, uh, uh, even suspend uh, local elections and all that. So it's quite uh, wide, widespread powers. Eh? And then, so that uh, lockdown eh, was only for two weeks. And then the next day, of course, the emergency, and that is until August, August 31st, until our independence uh, day. And it is very clear that the, the three important things uh, which were said by the Prime Minister was to suspend parliament, um, to suspend election, and the third thing is to, the courts, the courts will continue to function. I think all these three things are very key words. Uh, because if the court continues to, you know, the, if the court continues to go on, then, you know, the case of Zaid Hamidi, the AMNO president, you know, so basically saying the AMNO president court cases will go on, election will be suspended, uh, so there's no way an, an election can, can be called, and there's no way a parli through a parliament session, a word of no confidence uh, could be called. So everyone uh, knows that this is actually there's a power struggle, it's, it's mainly a power struggle within AMNO, which is now um, forcing this whole thing to take place. Uh, there was a report of uh, one AMNO MP declaring that he was jumping or you know, no longer willing to support the current government. And uh, what would have been the effect if the parliament had uh, continued and uh, he had done what he promised? I think uh, currently Muhyiddin does not have a majority. He has lost a simple majority because after that one Amno guy jumped, there's two others have also jumped. So now the latest total is uh, three and you need a uh, one, one, two to have a simple majority and uh, Muhyiddin has one, zero, eight now. So he has lost the majority. But then it doesn't mean anything actually because uh, you can, one is through a proclamation of, uh, you know, people go to, theoretically, the opposition can go and meet the king and say that they have the majority and the king can change the prime minister, you know, but uh, but now what is, looks like there is some sort of deal has been made between the prime minister who met the king because the prime minister also said election will be called in August. But I think, uh, uh, Peter, if I may, just to give you a bit of background, what's happening in AMNO is AMNO wants an election. Okay, that's very clear. Because if AMNO gets the election, uh, most likely AMNO will, uh, BN will win. And most importantly is the Zaid Hamidi faction within AMNO. You see, currently in the current government, you have... Um, most of the AMNO members, uh, leaders who are in the current government are actually not aligned to Zaid Hamidi's camp. These are people who are the faction eh, of uh, the, the team B of AMNO. So 
only through once an election is called, AMNO is a party where the president decides who are the candidates, you know. So for AMNO, an election is needed for them to get rid of the team B and then to go into election, win election, get rid of the court cases. And that is the plan of, of AMNO, I mean, Zaid Hamidi's AMNO. But on the Muhyiddin Yassin, if this could be stopped, what can happen is, if, a if Zaid Hamidi gets a conviction before, uh, before the election, that means by August he gets just a conviction. Huh? Uh, doesn't mean he goes to jail. I mean, he gets a conviction, then he can appeal. But once you, are get, you get a conviction, you can't stand in election. Right. So that will force AMNO members to say that, you know, then, then uh, Muhyiddin will have more breathing space, you see. Because his faction in AMNO may maybe work with Muhyiddin's party and they can, you know, continue to be in power. So are you saying then, so to, for this to happen, then the court case has to continue through yes. the state of emergency and that can take place? Yes, because um, Muhyiddin clearly said, stated in his statement that the courts will continue. Mm -hmm. We are not going to stop the function of the court. Yeah. At the same time, uh, under this current state of emergency, is it true that the Muhyiddin government now actually controls the state governments as well, not just the federal government? Is that true? You see, uh, uh, so far, on his speech, what in his speech he said, this is not... Uh, this is not like any other emergency, you know? It is not, a, uh, so he says the, the civil administration continues, one. He says the state, the state government continues, okay? Um, but, but he can make laws. The only thing now is they can make laws which don't have to go through parliament process. So these laws can be put in place which can curb uh, some of these freedoms. But currently, based on his uh, speech, was the state government won't be affected. Yeah. Right. Um, now, just to go back to the, the situation with the pandemic, um, it's the, the rise in numbers of infections is, uh, per day is uh, quite dramatic in the last period. Um, how is the, uh, you know, what does this say about the performance of the, of the, of the Muhyiddin government? in dealing with the pandemic and what things the PSM thinks, uh, you know, were not done right or should, should have been done that need to be done to address the pandemic. What's, what's the reason for the breakout for, for a start? You see, I, I think uh, we have been very uh, complacent after the, uh, this is the third spike. After the first two spike, because the push by the, to open up the economy so fast, Two things happened. One was the Sabah election. And the Sabah election actually did and did make sure that, you know, there was the cases in Sabah rose very highly. Eh? Most deaths in Malaysia, 60% uh, of deaths are in Sabah actually. So when the cases went up so high in Sabah, and then uh, it spread to rest of the peninsula. And of course, uh, so the general public view of election is very negative. You know, no one wants an election now. If you have a referendum, we'll, people will definitely say there's no for election, you know. So nobody is, is asking for an election because everybody fear an election is going to create, a, make the situation worse. So when they, so what, what happened was when the numbers were going up from uh, 100, 200, 500, 1,000, you know, people, the economy, eh, they were not, uh, nothing was done to stop the, uh, to, you know, to, to, to close down on. So a lot of things were allowed to take place. And then when you come, when we came up to like 2,000, 3,000, and, and, you know, initially Malaysia has a policy that anybody with COVID positive will be taken to the hospital, not home quarantine. And then when the system collapsed, and now they are, they have realized. So I think one way is one is that the Muhyiddin government. I mean, I mean they have left everything to the DG, you know, the Director General of Health. 
who has been a very popular character. He comes on TV daily and uh, everybody is like, uh, he, the health minister never appears in TV, Malaysian TV, you know. So uh, now there is a real, uh, people are now questioning uh, how it was handled at this current state, you know. How is the health system coping with both um, testing? So if you're getting about 2,000 to 3,000 new cases a day, how is it coping with testing, let alone treatment and hospital quarantine? If you're saying anyone who's infected goes into quarantine, if, how many places are there in the health system that can, you know, when does it run out at the rate of current new infections? They put, they put the figure close to something like 28, 29,000, no? total number of beds. So now it has gone above that. Huh? We are now about 30,000, I think, the active cases. So uh, now the new instruction is for people with um, no symptoms to quarantine at home. And this was only in the last uh, one week. You know, because before this, the government's uh, argument has been very strong, actually, that we are able to curb uh, the pandemic because we quarantine everybody. I mean, we take everyone into the hospital or the hostels or anything, you know. But now they can't handle it because uh, so that's that's the part of uh, those who are infected with COVID and they and they can't do contact tracing. They've also we have even uh, PSM members who have been like uh, found positive, waiting, you know, uh, normally they'll go in the initial stage, you'll get immediately a call. Uh, your close contacts will be immediately called for testing. Here, like after one week, even after that period of the COVID, the 14 days, after that they get a call to come, you know. So the system has sort of, and then there were people waiting to for the ambulance to be called. You know, ambulance. They'll say you'll be ambulance will be coming there to wait two or three days. So uh, in during those time, uh, of course, uh, they did not utilize the military or the you know to help in transporting work, uh, transporting those who are has been infected. So uh, now finally, uh, they have come to that realization. And of course, it's very interesting because Muhyiddin talks. One of the reasons for me, which is most interesting, he said, with the emergency, we can take over the private hospitals. <laughs> Something which which I think which is which we would definitely welcome, you know, to deal with this thing, you know. But I don't think so. That is the real reason for the emergency being called anyway. So, so far, there has not been any uh, uh, easily observed positive changes in, in the medical response since the declaration of emergency. Is that what you're saying? It seems to be the yes. same thing is going on. So that, you know, when the first two times we managed to handle the pandemic, that time numbers were less. Also testing, as you, as you asked earlier, uh, testing is done targeted, but it's not easy to get uh, testing, you know? So there is uh, a lot of people who volunteer and go to the testing centers will be told to get a referral letter or something, you know, or they will be, even if you say I'm a close contact of a, of a COVID positive, they say you don't have symptoms, you don't need to go for a testing, they ask you to go back home. So there was not enough um, testing available, though, though on paper, the statistics given uh, daily was, there's a huge, um, you know, that we can do a lot of testing is available, but in reality, it's, it's not the case. On, now, on ground in the, when the, the second spike in Malaysia took place, uh, the, 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 the blame was put on uh, migrant workers by and large. Um, has that, uh, you know, kind of uh, scapegoating now been broken down in the in the latest spike, which I suppose cannot be blamed on these people. Yeah, that's why I think the. In fact, when the third spike, first Sabah initially started in Sabah, they also blame on the migrants. You know, they said some people from uh, Philippines came came to Sabah and 
you know, our border control, you know, they blamed it on that. But but this time, uh, Muhyiddin gave statistics. Basically, he says most of the cases are not imported cases. Uh, foreigners are maybe less than 30% compared to the total COVID positive. So it looks now that, you know, now it is used to, now, now the statistics become very relevant to show that we need an emergency <laughs> because most Malaysians are infected by COVID. But on, on the issue of, uh, I think the, the migrant attack has sort of gone down. Uh, I think because the statistics itself shows, and also um, there was also recently some raids done in, uh, there's a new law, you know, the Minimum Housing and Amenities Act on housing for workers, mainly migrant workers. It's a very good act, actually. PSM welcomed this act, which the employers were finding ways not to implement, you know, saying COVID, uh, they don't have money and all that. But some very high profile raid was done by the government, including the minister uh, joining the raid, uh, where they showed very deplorable condition of uh, migrant labor homes, you know. And this triggered a lot of sympathy for migrants, the way they lived. So this is... I wouldn't see this happening in, during the second spike, but now, yeah. So things are, and, and yesterday, a group of NGOs blamed the government. They said, you know, this pandemic is so bad because you didn't allow, uh, you know, you, you, because of your policy, because um, you have a huge number of um, undocumented uh, workers who the government said, if who will who won't come forward for testing you know they'll be just arrested and deported you know so most of them would not have come forward where well, while uh, psm and the civil society were calling for the government in a, in a situation of pandemic you should be just allowing free uh, health care for all and do not have a monitorium on arrest on undocumented workers yes now, uh, let's talk about the economic uh, costs of this pandemic now as it's moving to almost a year long. Um, which uh, sections of uh, Malaysian society have uh, suffered the most uh, from the economic fallout of the pandemic? Actually, the, of course, the, the unemployment, eh? you, we had a monthly increasing of unemployment from like 30,000 a month, you know, people getting unemployed. Of course, in uh, PSM has a hotline. The hotline has now reduced a bit simply because that most people have lost jobs already, you know. So you see somewhere in uh, February, March, you had a lot of people calling in, you know. Now, we find that most people might have, might have already uh, lost their jobs. So it affects mainly the, the SMEs, small and medium enterprises. That, that is having a huge uh, impact. And of course, um, tourism, uh, entertainment uh, sectors. Which, but, but on the other hand, you know, the government sector and 30% Malaysian economy is controlled by the GLCs, government-linked companies. So they, it's not... I won't say the situation is really terrible, you know, but because now we notice that, you know, uh, when the government allowed EPF to be withdrawn, workers, people have to prove that they are unemployed for a certain period of time. Many people want to take out their money because they don't trust the government. No? <laughs> they want to take out the money, but they also can't take out the money because they are still being employed or, you know, so, but it, it the, the impact is there. And there is no uh, new, um, there's no new monitorium on loans and all that has been um, there at this point of time. Now, what is uh, the PSM's assessment of the how the, the the federal parliamentary opposition parties have uh, handled, you know, their response to the to the pandemic? You know, have they been playing a good role and? Or, or, or not, and and how have the the state governments that are affiliated to the federal opposition? How have they performed? 
have they performed or uh, done things that, um, that 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 other state governments have not done? Have they shown a lead in any way? Sorry, uh, Peter, could you repeat the question? Sorry. So the question uh, I have is, uh, what is the PSM's assessment of uh, the re the the response of the the opposition parties in parliament, in in the federal sphere, and also the state governments that are aligned to them? Have they done? Have they shown some lead on how in, on dealing with the pandemic? Okay, the, the opposition is really, uh, you know, they, they are always fighting and I think they can't, you know, though this is the first time that the ruling party has a, such a slim, uh, now they don't, even don't have the majority, the opposition cannot come together, you know, in the sense that, you know, um, one is of course the Anwar Mahade, you know, Mahade is part of the opposition and he can't get along with uh, Anwar. So, uh, so in that sense, even even there was discussion uh, yesterday on forming a shadow cabinet. They still don't have a shadow cabinet. They don't even have a shadow prime minister, shadow cabinet, you know, because and if if at all they want to form a shadow cabinet, they will have to have maybe three shadow ministers because they have to allocate the seat among them. You know, they can't agree on one. So they have not been really doing very well. Uh, they are not even prepared. Even if election is called tomorrow, they're going to do badly. So I think they're quite happy that until August, they got some time to plan. Okay, and, and uh, so they have not been showing much uh, leadership as well. Even, even in the opposition, um, where the opposition controls like in Penang and in uh, Slangon, uh, there's not much, um, uh, we don't see anything happening, you know. Uh, anything uh, different happening, and of course everything is uh, everything is uh, dealing with the pandemic and COVID. That's one reason. But beyond that, you don't see anything else happening. So, uh, so the op opposition are the strongest in numbers, but the weakest as far as <laughs> they uh, to take over power. Yeah. So finally, Arul, um, can you um, sum up what? are the, the key um, uh, demands that PSM is making uh, in terms of addressing the pandemic? You know, that what, what are the things that you are campaigning or fighting for uh, to, to address the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, actually, um, our main concern has been the, I mean, we one thing we, uh, we welcome the postponement of election until up to August, you know, we are okay with that, you know, because we think uh, people are not ready for election and we think election is not going to resolve any of the issues. But we have been uh, on two fronts. One, we've been asking for a universal basic income of uh, 1,000 ringgit for every, uh, those who are jobless. And we have got some criteria uh, how this should be done, you know, and we have presented papers to the government, to the current government, and we have not got any response to that. So what, and that is one. On the second thing is we are asking for a monitorium of loans. They, they had a monitorium earlier, but they have stopped it. We want it to continue because I think most uh, workers face uh, financial problems in paying back. This would be seen as the first two main demand. The third one is of course the healthcare. And uh, PSM is, is, one, is the secretariat of a coalition of civil society groups where we have put clear uh, demands to the government, you know, how to deal with the, how to deal with the situation. And of course, uh, now the whole question about vaccine, how uh, vaccine should be distributed and, and uh, those concerns. So these are the three, three main things. Uh, one is on the income, job security, Second thing on uh, monitorium, mainly for housing kind of housing loans. And of course, the third is health. Yeah. Well, thanks, Arul. Um, that um, sounds like a very um, interesting time ahead because we'll see how the emergency is used or abused by the current government. 
and uh, good luck with um, uh, dealing with the pandemic directly with your own members. I guess you are locked down once again now, so you are all yeah. uh, working from home. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All the best to comrades there. <laughs>